three kind of macronutrient based rules control carbohydrates that means don't get your carbohydrates from bags and boxes with barcodes focus on whole fruits and vegetables eat them liberally enjoy and then the second and third rules kind of come together because in nature they always do prioritize protein and don't be afraid of fat how do we prevent diabetes and reverse insulin resistance this is a big topic for you this is a major focus in terms of your academic research uh so let's start there yeah yeah, so first of all, I'll just mention briefly what the connection is between the two in the first place. So insulin resistance is the foundation of type 2 diabetes. So the way you ask the question makes all the sense in the world. When we appreciate that, here's type 2 diabetes, and beneath it, as I said, is this firm foundation of insulin resistance. There is no type 2 diabetes without insulin resistance preceding it and being the foundation upon which the disease is built. Um, thankfully, when we acknowledge that, then type 2 diabetes does, in fact, become reversible, which, Max, uh, we have to admit, conventional clinical care would not say that. Mm. Conventional care will say type 2 diabetes is irreversible because if you try to reverse this metabolic disease with a medication, it will not reverse it. It will address some of the symptoms of it, but it will never reverse it. Thus, it becomes a chronic irreversible disease. But when we acknowledge that insulin resistance is caused by diet, uh, poor diet choices, then better diet choices can become the solution to it. So we have in the food we eat, both the culprit and the cure, it just depends on how we do it. Uh, so with, with um, insulin resistance, there are distinct inputs or, or distinct causes of insulin resistance, namely chronically elevated insulin, inflammatory marker, inflammatory mediators will cause insulin resistance, and stress. Those latter two, stress and inflammation, while yes, indeed, are each independent causes, they're also very vague. It's difficult to kind of get a firm grasp on them, and thus we turn our attention more to insulin. If chronically elevated insulin is a feature and, and a cause of, of insulin resistance, how can we lower that? And that has immediate benefits. So you, the question, how, do, how can we address type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance? If a person lowers their insulin, then that's going to be the most rapid improvements in insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes, which is the most obvious effect of insulin resistance, but there are also many, many more, including migraines and cognitive decline and fatty liver disease and infertility. All of those share a common core of insulin resistance, but you'd asked about type two. So just to put the nail on that specifically, you can reverse type two diabetes. We did that in 90 days in a clinical, in a, in a case study that we did with a local physicians group. Um, we took 11 women with full blown, full diagnosed type two diabetes, and they were given a choice you can start taking drugs, which you will take for the rest of your life, or you can do 90 days of a dietary intervention, all targeted to lower your insulin. And in 90 days, these 11 women who all chose the dietary route, there was literally not a single clinical marker of the disease. Never a pill popped in this whole process. No medication taken. It was just purely acknowledging that this is a lifestyle disease and thus it has a lifestyle solution. Fascinating. So how does one begs the, the obvious follow up question is, how do we reduce our insulin? Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, insulin is the hormone of the fed state. And when we acknowledge that's not my term, that, that's a long used term of, of famous metabolic scientists, famous to, to, to me and, and to a handful of us, um, but of course not acknowledged at all. Um, like George Cahill, for example, was a famous fasting scientist. Um, and he called, he would refer to insulin as the hormone of the fed state because mm. you, it cannot stay elevated if calories aren't coming in. It is antithetical to its very existence. One of the most overlooked yet, yet power, powerful effects of insulin is how it utterly and totally dictates fuel use at every single cell of the body. There's no exception to this. Um, it, that's what part of what makes insulin so unique is that literally every cell in the body will respond to insulin. It has insulin receptors. There is no exception to this. And what insulin does at all of these cells is tell the cell what to do with energy. Now, there's a lot of implications here, but when we just focus on 
on insulin and its role in insulin resistance to kind of bring it back to that. And then maybe we can touch on the relevance of the fat cells in just a moment. But if, if insulin, um, if there's no calories coming in, insulin must steadily start to drop. And the more insulin drops, the more the body becomes insulin sensitive at various cells. And then we've resolved the problem. So minute for minute, the most like per unit time, the most effective way to lower insulin is through fasting. Obviously, if there's simply no calories coming in, insulin must start to drop and drop quickly. And this is why you have guys like Jason Fung who can take people with type two diabetes uh, and within just weeks, they have to get off all of their medications, all of their myriad anti-diabetic medications. They have to drop because the disease has resolved itself. And now the medication is doing more harm than good as many medications do anyway, um, every medication is just a gamble of, is the side effect I want worth the side effects I don't want? Uh, so any, um, that's just highlights the power of fasting. And then other than that, Max, I would, I would submit that the best way then to eat, because you have to eat at some point, would be to move into what I refer to as a nutrient fast, where we have the caloric fast, which is if no calories are coming in, insulin must come down. But when you eat, and you will need to, focus on the nutrients that have the least impact on insulin, namely fats and proteins. If So if when they do eat, they're focusing on fats and proteins, it allows the insulin levels to stay very, very low. There may be a modest bump, but nothing if it's uh, if the body starts consuming refined starches. Now, mm. I'm not de I'm not declaring war on carbohydrates. I'm not saying that we shouldn't eat any, um, but I think it's a particular tragedy that our dietary paradigm is based on the one macronutrient that humans literally don't need to eat. Um, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. There are such things as essential fats and essential proteins or amino acids. And so we should focus on those to make sure we're properly nourished and we have you know, a, a grand nutrient density. Um, but my rules with diet. So the first is fast, you know, find a way to fast, but more important than how long a person fasts, I strongly submit is how they end their fast. That's the part that's often overlooked. Someone nowadays will casually shrug their shoulders and say, I'm going to do a 36 hour fast and there's no plan for how they end it. And it ends up becoming a big kind of glamorous binge purge cycle. That's, that's a kind of crass way of describing it, but they will fast, 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 like they're purging in a way. And then they just get so hungry. They don't have a plan and they just go bonkers on a bunch of junk food. They overeat, they feel sick, they have shame, they have remorse, and they have this resolved commitment that they're going to do better tomorrow. And they do the exact same thing again and again. So it's a binge purge cycle. So how you end your fast is more important than how long you fast. So make sure you have a plan, make sure that it's focused on proteins and fats. But basically, when we do eat, I believe, and this was the advice we gave these patients with type 2 diabetes, don't count your calories, eat when you're hungry, don't eat when you're not, but follow these through three kind of macronutrient-based rules. Control carbohydrates. That means don't get your carbohydrates from bags and boxes with barcodes. Focus on whole fruits and vegetables. Eat them liberally. Enjoy. And then the second and third rules kind of come together because in nature, they always do prioritize protein and don't be afraid of fat. The best proteins in nature, which is to say animal based proteins, it's not popular to say that, but I'm a scientist, I'm a cell biologist, so I don't have to worry about the current political or social pressures, or that's at least how scientists should be. Um, oh, that. That's in rare form these days. But nevertheless, all of the best proteins in nature, which are animal proteins for humans, always come with fat. That's how we should eat them. We shouldn't be worried about getting the leanest cuts of meat like chicken breast. And we shouldn't be worried about the fat that comes with the steak or with the with the eggs or with the whole milk. That's how they're designed to come. We digest proteins better when they come with fat. The combination of the two is more anabolic at muscle in humans than the protein alone is. It's, all, it's as if nature knew uh, or God, wh whatever we ascribe to, knew what it was doing. Um, and, and that's how the human body is meant to consume it. So those are the rules. Control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat. Um, all kind of following the first rule, which is don't feel like you need to eat every few hours. The idea, and Max, you can see how we got it perfectly wrong, right? We've been told that our diet should, con be, should consist predominantly of carbohydrates and that we should eat six times a day. 
for goodness sakes. What a wonderful way to make sure that your insulin is elevated every waking moment of the day and well into the evening, well into nighttime, and, and thus becoming ever more insulin resistant because chronically elevated insulin is a cause of insulin resistance. So again, wouldn't you know it, we got it perfectly wrong. Yeah, I mean, I was raised with the food pyramid, which has thankfully been retired, but that uh, was a paradigm that implored everybody who followed it to consume 7 to 11 servings of, of grains a day. And when you yep. looked at the base of the illustrated food pyramid, it was pasta, it was bread, it was rolls, right? And today we have the MyPlate paradigm, which is really not that much better. If you actually go to the MyPlate website, yeah, and you enter in your some basic anthropometric uh, figures um, about yourself, it gives you the, recommenda the recommended amount of uh, grain servings per day to ingest. And depending on calorie needs, that can go up to 10 servings. And what satisfies a serving of grains? A slice of bread. So you could be eating 10 slices of bread a day. That's crazy. And be completely copacetic with the, the suggestions of the MyPlate paradigm. Yeah, it's a wonderful way to become fat and diabetic. And, and it's working. Fascinating. So, I mean, I, I guess there's this debate that at least I've uh, caught wind of within the, the nutrition community as to what cr what creates the conditions of insulin resistance. Is it we consume too many carbohydrates and that causes insulin to be chronically elevated or is it uh, more a, a, a symptom of energy toxicity where yeah, yeah. It, irrespective of where that energy comes from, it creates uh, this sort of energy toxicity scenario in the yeah, body, yeah. which drives insulin resistance. What's your, oh, what's my, your take? I, I love that you just asked this question because it allows me to flex some muscles that I've been working on for some time. So one of the problems, so, so no doubt. So insulin is the hormone of the fed state. So when there are calories coming in, insulin will in some, to some degree, it should be impacted. And yet when you look, when someone eats pure fat, we're doing, I can speak on some authority with this. There's a lot of misunderstandings, but I'm literally doing these studies in humans in my lab today, uh, where this is ongoing. When someone drinks pure fat, there is no insulin effect. Now, and this has been shown out in multiple human studies. I've, I have yet to see a study that has shown a significant increase in insulin with the consumption of pure fat. Some people will cite studies in people with type 1 diabetes. But the problem with people with type 1 diabetes is that they all have excessive levels of glucagon, the hormone glucagon. So there's this confounding variable that is not present in the non-type 1 diabetic. And so I don't think those rules should apply. Indeed, they don't. If we're not talking about a diabetic person, um, fat consumption alone has no effect on insulin. And thus, we've kind of uncoupled this idea of energy toxicity, which I appreciate that term. My PhD is bioenergetics. As much as people want to, I think I'm in some ways more qualified than most people to spot, speak about energy use in cells, um, uh, despite being branded a heretic because I think we focus on energy too much or we focus on calories too much. It's not because I don't think calories matter. It's just that if our, if our paradigm of insulin resistance and obesity and metabolic problems is energy-based, we overlook the exceptionally relevant variable of hormones. Because as I said, insulin and other hormones tell the body what to do with the energy that it has. Now, one of there's so many thoughts I have, and I hope I can get to all of them, albeit briefly. One of the confounding variables in any weight loss study or study that measures insulin resistance, which is so connected to weight loss or weight gain because it's so connected to what's happening to fat cells for reasons that I won't get into at the moment, and we might have previously. But um, with uh, every diet, almost every diet that has ever had a, a randomized clinical study where this is the low fat group, this is the low carb group, every one of them was a lower calorie diet. That immediately blows the whole thing apart. Because anytime energy comes down, it's going to depress insulin. So even the low fat diet, which is heavier in carbohydrates, compared to where they started, where they were made, the patients might have been eating 2,500 or 3,000 calories a day. Now they've been clamped at 1,800. Well, that's a confounding variable. So what we should do, and I'm hoping that either I or someone else is going to do this, is do hypercaloric overfeeding studies push them up and see who can take the most energy and gain the least amount of weight. At that point, all of a sudden, we're going to start to see a difference. I'm very, very confident. Again, low carb, low fat, they're both low calorie, 
So it's a confounding variable that no one really accounts for. And so, of course, the insulin is going to come down and get better. But even in those studies, not once has there ever been a study that found the low-fat diet outperformed the low-carb at improving insulin sensitivity. Never, not one. There have been dozens of studies that have shown improvements where the low-carb diet, despite being calorie clamped, outperformed the low-fat. If there weren't such data, I never would have begun pounding on that drum in the first place. Now, um, with regards to energy and insulin, we have to appreciate um, the aspect of, of the fat cell and the fat cell growing and shrinking. And the most compelling evidence is once again in the type one diabetic. So you can take a type one diabetic and if when, before they're diagnosed, um, so before there's any insulin, insulin has dropped, there are two things happening in these people. One, they have voracious appetites where they are easily eating 4,000 calories a day, but at the same, despite being a small little teenager, but at the same time, they are wasting away and they have no body fat. They look like they're a prisoner of war. They're emaciated, they're wasting away, but they're eating 4,000 calories a day. Now, some people ignorantly, if I may be so bold, would say, well, it's because they're urinating out all the glucose. Because yes, if insulin's down, glucose levels are through the roof and it will result in glucose spilling into the urine. But that can only account for a couple, maybe 300 calories a day at the most. What about the other 2000 calories? Where the hell is that all going? This is where insulin is too overlooked. And much to my dismay, a lot of prominent voices that used to be kind of low carb or becoming all low energy again. But it's it's ignorant um, in my view, because when insulin is down, the body cannot store energy. It is literally impossible. And so we'd have to say, as a bioenergeticist, I'd say, well, then what happens to the energy? Because it needs to be accounted for. Well, there are multiple mechanisms. So when insulin is low, but energy is still coming in, the body insulin, when it's out of the way, um, will allow various wasting processes, energetic wasting to come into play. So the pure kind of calories in, calories out model is you either store it or you burn it. Well, ins low insulin will address the burning part because when insulin is low, metabolic rate will spike by about 15 to 20% over normal mm. conditions. So you literally start increasing the idle of the engine. We've known this for over 100 years the legendary scientists in the realm of endocrinology, Elliot P. Joslin, and metabolic rate, Francis Benedict. Uh, there's a whole metabolic equation still named after him, the Benedict equation that people still use and invoke. They found in people with type 1 diabetes, the metabolic rate was about 20% higher than it should be. Wow. And then in subsequent years, once insulin therapy came onto the scene, once you treat the, di the patient with insulin, Boom, metabolic rate immediately slows to where you'd, where you'd expect. The same thing happens in people with type 2 diabetes. If they're given insulin therapy, which they never should, their metabolic rate will slow down. But basically, this is insulin's way of saying, hey, if I'm up, I'm so determined to store energy in fat cells that I'm going to depress the entire metabolic rate across the whole body just to store more energy. But we can never account for that, right? Max, people who want to say, this is my basal metabolic rate and I'm exercising to burn more energy. But what about insulin as a confounding variable? No one ever is appreciating that insulin will literally depress metabolic rate, or if it's low, allow metabolic rate to accelerate. Again, to the tune of about 300 calories a day. That is not an insignificant amount of energy. But at the same time, when insulin is low, the body is so inclined to waste energy that now it starts literally emitting energetic caloric molecules from the body in the form of ketones. It's a little known fact that every ketone has the same, roughly the same caloric value as a molecule of glucose does. And now all of a sudden, if a patient is in ketosis, which they are if insulin is low, and of course, ketones are simply products of fat burning. I hate to demystify this villain. Ketones are simply pieces of fat burning. Um, and then we start breathing these ketones out into the atmosphere. We are urinating them out into the toilet. And these are every one of these ketones has a caloric value that either needed to be burned or stored based on the traditional view. But now we've introduced this third avenue, which is just wasting. We are literally just taking this energy that was stored in fat in our fat cells as fat in our fat cells. Now we're breaking it down and just 
dumping it from the body. And no one ever accounts for the ketones. No one ever tries to reconcile, well, all right, well, now how many calories, how many hundreds of, of calories worth of ketones are we dumping from the body here? All because insulin is low. So the whole idea to kind of bring it all back to your question, which started this long winded rant, energy toxicity has, there's value to that paradigm. And yet I challenge it because if someone was eating an excess of energy and it was coming from protein and fat, then, but insulin is low, then the body has ways of reconciling that energy excess. It'll, it'll increase the metabolic rate and it will start dumping calories in the form of ketones emitted through the breath and in the urine. But if insulin is elevated and there's this toxicity of energy, in other words, hypercaloric, the body must store it because insulin will not allow the energy to go to waste. Ketogenesis is shut off completely. Metabolic rate is slowed by about 300 calories a day, all in an effort to preserve or conserve the energy because insulin is the hormone of the fed state. It wants to store energy, not burn it. And that effect persists across every cell of the body. Fascinating. I love the story of the metabolic advantage that you uh, that you spoke to that we uh, yeah apparently get when we are on a low, a low carbohydrate diet. So just to make things really clear and from, you know, for my own clarity, as well as that of the audience, if you are, when, if you can, if you were to control for calories in a hypoenergetic state, so if somebody's in, in, in other words, a calorie deficit, a low carb diet compared to a low fat diet, um, at the same calorie level, you're secreting less insulin on yes. the low carbohydrate diet compared to the low fat diet. Yep, and this is why there to my knowledge there are two very very well controlled studies that have found even in caloric deficit controlled isocaloric diets the metabolic rate is higher in the low carb. Mm. Um David Ludwig at Harvard published a paper using doubly labeled water to prove that and then even one of the great ketogenic diet detractors Dr. Kevin Hall at the NIH I'm sure much to his chagrin he also found a, st a statistically significant elevation in metabolic rate, despite isocaloric and low calorie on the ketogenic or low carb group. Um, so offering even modern, very current um, support for what we'd seen 100 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Walk me through how insulin resistance actually develops, because I think this is also a fascinating um, part of the story. It's mm -hmm. my understanding that it's what what uh, it, it, it it's developed when basically we surpass our bodies a, a, a specific fat threshold, right? Yeah. Whereby the fat ends up flowing into our organs, essentially ectopic fat, creating fat in our liver, in our pancreas. Yeah. Is that is that sort of when it when it all starts to go downhill? Yeah. So the first part of that uh, I think is is better supported than the second part, but I'll touch on both um, because I've I've um, I've published on both of these ideas before. Um, so the the first idea is invoking the fat cell, which is very very appropriate, and mentioning this kind of compelling idea of the personal fat threshold. There's a tremendous amount of value to that kind of overly simplified view that the body uh, individual across all individual people and ethnicities and sexes, the body has uh, a kind of an ideal amount of, of fat storage uh, 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 above which when the threshold is surpassed, now the body starts to become insulin resistant. But the flaw is that we start invoking this kind of general lipotoxicity idea because that's too often misunderstood um, to, to invoke. And so the idea that the fat cell is now overflowing with fat and now this fat is getting stored aberrantly throughout the body, that does happen. But the degree to which that now stored fat throughout the body is actually a metabolic problem, that is less well established. Mm. But let me touch on that point first, and then we'll come back to the nature of the fat cell as kicking the whole thing off. Um, the, the problem with that kind of lipotoxicity, uh, ectopic fat storage idea is that when we store the fat in other tissues, we store it as triglycerides and triglycerides are metabolically inert. They do not cause insulin resistance. Triglycerides do not cause insulin resistance. Uh, I can say that in, in the strongest possible terms, but there are fats that do. 
So triglycerides are in the family of fat called glycerolipids. There's a glycerol with fatty acids combined to it. That's a triglyceride. But the fat, the type of fat that is metabolically toxic, if you will, that does cause insulin resistance is a type of fat in an entirely different family called the sphincolipids, named after the enigmatic sphinx because for so many decades we didn't know what they did. Well, we know a lot more now than we did decades ago. One of the effects of these sphingolipids, in particular kind of the backbone of them all, ceramides, is to in fact disrupt the insulin signaling cascade. When ceramides accumulate in a cell, they will block the insulin signal at various points ultimately disrupting the insulin signal and causing insulin resistance as we understand it throughout the body. Um, and these, th these fatty acids that come from the overflowing, overflowing fat cell can in fact contribute to the, to the, the, the biosynthesis of sphingolipids and the accumulation in cells. So that's absolutely true. But what's interesting is that they do so by activating inflammatory mediators or inflammatory receptors on the surface of the cell. And so this comes back to the kind of three cardinal causes of insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, uh, cortisol, in other words, stress, and then inflammation. Um, I'm unaware of any cause of insulin resistance that won't in some way go through those three. Um, but those three um, especially the hyperinsulinemia, become relevant in the case of the fat cell. So now to come back to the former part of that question, Fat tissue on a body can grow through two different ways. Um, it, it, the body can either be expanding its fat mass through a process called hyperplasia or a process called hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is when the number of cells, and in this case, the fat cells, starts uh, is increasing. So the fat cells are multiplying to continue to be able to store more fat. And in that paradigm, the fat cells are never very big. Each individual fat cell stays very modest in size, and, and a modestly sized or a normal sized fat cell is a healthy, insulin sensitive, anti-inflammatory fat cell. And both of those problems will become relevant when we describe the other version of fat storage, hypertrophy. When a person is gaining fat through hypertrophy of the fat cells, that is when the number of fat cells isn't changing. It can change a little bit. But now the size of the fat cell is expanding. And, and Max, the difference is, is remarkable. The actual volume change is 10 times bigger. Wow. So when a cell goes, when a fat cell undergoes hypertrophy, it, it expands by 10 times. There is no cell in the body that is capable of such massive change as the fat cell is in volume, tenfold increase in volume. <laughs> Once the fat cell starts to get to that point, it literally is reaching a maximum point that the cell membrane can stay intact. And so the hypertrophic fat cell is, is basically now starting to tell insulin, this is a juvenile way of explaining it, but it works. It, it starts to tell insulin, insulin, you are elevated because of the way the body is eating. You are continually trying to tell me to grow. I cannot grow anymore lest I literally fall apart. So you're trying to inhibit me from breaking down my fats through a process called lipolysis, but I'm not going to listen anymore. I can't stop you from putting fat in, and it can't, but now I'm not going to let you stop me from taking fat out. And so all of a sudden, the hypertrophic adipocyte becomes resistant to insulin's anti-lipolytic effects. In other words, it will not let insulin stop it from breaking down fat anymore. And thus, free fatty acids start to dump from the hypertrophic fat cell into the blood. Because insulin normally acts like a one-way valve on your fat cells, right? When, Abs the, when the fat right. cell is insulin sensitive. But as Good. the fat cell hypertrophies, then it itself becomes insulin resistant, thereby uh, becoming tolerant to, those, to, to that effect yep. of insulin. Yeah, yes. So, so it becomes insulin resistant to prevent further growth, to ensure its own survival. Wow. And then basically the fat cell says, I, sorry, rest of the body, <laughs> sorry about what this is doing to you guys. You're an innocent bystander, but I, I have to do this or I'm dead. And that's going to be bad for all of us. And and that's true. But then the second effect plays into this as well. There, there's these two overlapping yet independent effects, but both consequential of the, hypertro of the hypertrophy. So once all the fat cells are pushing to 10 times their normal volume, they begin pushing themselves further and further away from capillaries. 
And the capillary is the site of nutrient and gas exchange. A cell must be within a few microns of a capillary in order to survive. But as the cells are getting so big, unlike any nothing else in the body can do this, the fat cells begin to become hypoxic. They're low on oxygen. They simply cannot get enough oxygen because they're, they're too far from the blood vessels. And so the hypertrophic fat cell, to ensure its own survival, begins secreting a full profile of pro-inflammatory proteins, some of which can induce the synthesis of new capillaries. And so some of these pro-inflammatory molecules called cytokines will kind of seep through the interstitial space, get to the capillaries, move into the capillaries, and then not only stimulating inflammation or immune reactions throughout the entire body, inflammation is a cause of insulin resistance, but then it will to ensure the fat cell survival, start resulting in the budding off of new capillaries to try to correct or resolve the hypoxia. So once again, the fat cell tells the rest of the body, hey guys, I'm sorry, I can't stop growing because the way the body is eating, and it would be catastrophic to the whole body if I started literally falling apart. So we all have to kind of suffer a little bit, but it'll help me survive and that'll help the body survive, albeit in a sicker state than it was before. Wow, fascinating. And at that point, does the do the are the fat cells leaking fat into the blood? They're leaking free fatty acids. That's part of the first problem. When the fat cell's so big, it becomes resistant to insulin's anti-lipolytic effects. Mm. And now it's dumping free fatty acids. That is why, Max, I'm such an advocate of people measuring free fatty acids. That is not the same as measuring triglycerides, which are carried on VLDL and LDL. Free fatty acids move independently. They Well, they get carried on albumin, but they're their own thing. And if someone, uh, it's a very interesting test that people can do called the adipo IR or the adipose insulin resistance index. Free fatty acids and insulin should never be in the same place at the same time. If a person has eaten and they had some starches, and sugars, which most people do, insulin will be elevated, free fatty acids will be low because insulin has gone up, telling the fat cells to store energy, and thus lipolysis has stopped, so free fatty acids are low. But when someone's fasting, insulin comes down, lipolysis or fat breaking down is disinhibited, and so free fatty acids will be high. But this test, if both free fatty acids are high and insulin is high, now you're detecting insulin resistance at the fat cell, which I believe is the first cell to fall metabolically. It's the first domino that once pushed over will start to dump into all the rest, contributing to insulin resistance through the excess of free fatty acids like we talked about and the pro-inflammatory molecules, the cytokines that we talked about basically promoting the insulin resistance throughout the body, causing insulin resistance in the brain, contributing to Alzheimer's disease, or insulin resistance in the blood vessels, contributing to hypertension or erectile dysfunction, and too many more for me to mention. Wow. So how do we fix this, Ben? How do we, yeah. how do we get to the root cause so that we can uh, reverse potentially type 2 diabetes, lose the body fat, Yep. Um, belly fat in particular is something that I think a lot of people struggle with and is, is, is particularly dangerous. Um, yeah. What's the prescription here? Yeah. Yeah. So we touched on it a little bit at the outset where it was kind of lower the inflammation, lower the insulin in particular. That's kind of the most powerful lever, but just so I don't get too redundant, I'll kind of present a different view. Let's take a kind of fat first focus where we look at the hypertrophic fat cell and we say, all right, we got to shrink that hypertrophic fat cell at all costs, and that will start to improve insulin resistance. That's a good idea. That's a good paradigm. So we can shrink a fat cell through two ways, through low calorie or low insulin or, or both. The problem is too many people start, and both of those strategies have value. Absolutely. Both low insulin and low energy absolutely have value. But I think there is a timing or a temporality to this that makes it more effective. For example, if someone's going to start this, they listen to this conversation and they say, I'm going low energy, in other words, low calorie, that will shrink fat cells. But if, if that is your first step, and your body hasn't adjusted to using ketones for fuel, and your insulin is still a little elevated, and so your glucose is kind of maybe getting low as you're eating less carbs, but your ketones are also low because you still have insulin resistance, the brain will start to sense this relative lack of nutrients and be hungry. And hunger 
always wins. Mm. So if someone's starting this fat shrinking journey with a low energy approach, they're generally going to fail because hunger is going to come raging into their into their brain and hunger wins. And so they'll break after a week or two. They just can't handle the deprivation anymore. So my view very strongly is that start, let the first step of this fat shrinking journey be the low insulin step. Because that is based on the paradigms that I mentioned earlier, control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat, and eat when you're hungry. You don't have to be hungry. There's no deprivation. If you're hungry, well, then have some hard-boiled eggs, have some cheese, have a big juicy steak, have a salad with chicken and olive oil and vinegar on it. And so you're you're following those rules, but so you're eating when you're hungry. You don't have to deprive yourself and force your brain to go against you know, the, this state of, of hunger. Um, and, and, and you, so it's, it's more sustainable and the fat cells are shrinking because if insulin is low, fat cells must shrink. They have to, they, they literally cannot maintain their size. If insulin is at a fasted state, it is impossible. Well, what about, cause I've seen some, some evidence pointing to, uh, the insulinogicity of, um, protein sources, right? Like, yeah, yeah. like whey protein is something that I regularly integrate in, into my diet personally. Mm-hmm. And I know Good. that it has a very high insulin producing, uh, capacity. Same with, uh, yeah. with beef, if, if I'm not mistaken. So how do we, yeah, how, do, yeah. how do we reconcile that? So I very much appreciate, there was a study done years ago, uh, and I've never been able to reconcile it because they will say that beef has as much of an insulogenic effect as like bread or something like that. And I just don't know I don't know how they came to those numbers. Once again, we're doing a human study in my lab where people consume pure whey in the context of a low carb diet. And that is very important. And there is a very, very modest insulin effect. It may go up a few points, unlike fat, which doesn't go up at all. And very unlike glucose, which goes up by 10 times, um, insulin may get up to about a 20% increase over a fasting state. And then it comes down pretty quickly. So it's a very modest effect. And we're actually studying why some people have higher glucose levels um, in the context of a low-carb, protein-heavy diet. It's not the insulin. Um, Glucose is happening through other effects through like epinephrine and glucagon, but I won't get into that at the moment. Um, So uh, I would encourage people to look up a talk that I gave on this very topic because there's so much more to say than I have the time to now, but basically, so if people just do a YouTube search for Bickman, um, protein glucagon, Mm. they'll find the talk I gave about it. And I go into much more detail, but basically the insulinogenic effect of the, of the protein will be based on the underlying glycemia. So in other words, if you had someone who is hyperglycemic, like a type two diabetic, and they ate pure protein compared to a non-diabetic, there's going to be a vastly different insulin effect because if insulin, uh, if, if glucose is elevated and protein comes in, you now kind of have a double hit that you have to account for. But if if the protein's being consumed in the context of a low carbohydrate or a fasted state, then there's essentially very, very little or no insulin effect. And again, I'm literally doing these studies. We had two patients in, or two subjects, not patients, um, two subjects that were in this morning. One of them was on their protein day. The other one was on their glucose day. But we're just trying to fully kind of characterize all of the hormone response to the three macronutrients um, in the context of a low-carb diet to just understand this unique state. Because there's been a lot published in the context of normal, high-carb fed people, but little to nothing in the context of low-carb diets. And I, I should emphasize, this is a study that is being sponsored by Levels Health, the CGM um, guys who make the software, they were very, very welcome uh, supporters of this study. So I just really want to give them a shout out for supporting basic research like this. So yeah, anyway, Max, the, the, the insulin concern that people will have with regards to protein, I think is overblown. I don't think people need to worry about it, but I would also say protein is not meant to be consumed alone. Mm. Protein is meant to be consumed with fat. That's how we should eat it. I think in our hubris, we have pulled the two apart. They should be consumed together. We will absorb it. We will digest the protein better and put it to use more effectively than if we consume alone. Uh, if we consume it alone, and, um, and as much as I'm an advocate of protein, that's my second rule: prioritize protein. That's the one thing in the diet I think people should explicitly try to get more of. I don't think we should explicitly get more fat. 
but let the fat come with the protein. And if we want to be liberal with the butter or whatever, so be it. But that's not what we're targeting. We're targeting the protein. But I think people have gone too far. I think there are voices in, in the dietary space that now it's protein at all costs. And I think that is not I don't think that is reflected in human ancestral eating. I don't think there's ever been an instance where humans were trying to only get protein and were trimming off the fat or removing the fat from the milk or dumping the yolk. It is not an accident that our ancestors will, one, never ate chicken meat. We never ate chicken meat until the last hundred years ish. Interesting. So we became afraid. You look at chicken consumption in the United States from 1909 till now, it was it was practically zero. Mm. It was in the very, very low kind of single digits. And now it's the single most commonly consumed meat because it's so lean and we're so afraid of fat. Once upon a time, we kept chickens for their eggs. And it would have been laughable throughout human history to dump the yolk and keep the whites. It would have been laughable in human history to trim, to skim the fat from the milk and drink a skim milk. It would have been laughable to trim the, the, the fat, to not eat the fatty organs of the body or to trim the fat off of leaner meat. We just have become so demented and so convinced that fat is an enemy because of our fear of heart disease and our fear of calories that it's led us into these, I think, problematic patterns. Again, I'm not saying protein is bad, far from it. I've been one of the most outspoken defenders and advocates of protein, especially in the low carb space. I think the pendulum has simply swung too far. Protein is meant to be consumed with fat. Calories should never be counted. It is, in my view, it is a way to fail because it puts, it introduces tedium into something that should be enjoyable. Eating should be enjoyable. And the moment we have to count stuff, I would say count anything, even carbohydrates. If, if the carbohydrates are from these non-starchy, sugary sources, like vegetables that grow above the ground and fruits that aren't tropical, like bananas, pineapples, mangoes, don't even count them. Enjoy them. The moment we start counting things, we've removed, we've introduced tedium, like I said, into something that should be enjoyable, making the whole thing much less enjoyable than it was and likely less sustainable than it would be otherwise. Yeah, I agree with you. First of all, great word, tedium. Wow, uh, yeah. in, in, incredible word. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to add that to my repertoire. But um, <laughs> no, I agree because uh, the the advice the advice that a lot of people get is to simply eat less of the obesogenic food that they are currently eating, and I think in so doing, they're setting themselves up for failure. So if you want to see change, I think it's really important that people understand you have to change. You have to change your diet, right? You yep. can't eat the same diet that you were eating before and expect. A difference in terms of your in terms of your metabolic health, your overall health, your body composition. So it's 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 a phenomenal advice. It, why would protein stimulate insulin? Isn't there is there some aspect of insulin that allows amino acids, for example, to get oh, into the muscle cell? Like absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so that's actually interesting. I shouldn't say absolutely too quickly. The idea that insulin stimulates amino acid uptake into the muscle is very debated. Mm. There's there's count there's contrary evidence to that idea showing in muscle cells that it, indeed it it does not um, facilitate. It is not necessary for amino acid uptake, but Insulin is necessary to defend protein in tissue, including muscle. In other words, insulin is anti-proteolytic. Mm. It is telling the muscle, don't break down, because insulin doesn't want to break anything down. Insulin wants to build, 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 which is why it becomes relevant to amino acids. So there are amino acids that will stimulate insulin secretion from the beta cells. Absolutely true, because it's basically just the amino acids way of saying, hey, we're going to go into the muscle and build some muscle. We want to make, can you help us stay there? And, and that's that's kind of the difference. So insulin is anabolic in that it defends muscle, if not necessarily building muscle. And I think that's one of the interesting things that we've gotten wrong in bodybuilding, because you'll look at the physique of Arnold and Lou from the 1970s um, and compare them to the physiques of the modern guys. No one knows who they are because they're all so irrelevant nowadays. And they all have these oddly distended bellies, mm. these kind of bubble bellies they're called, where there's this glorious six pack built on top of an oddly distended stomach. And I, there have been some people that have speculated. I agree with the speculation. It is speculation. There's no studies to prove this, that once insulin became a part of the cocktail of anabolic hormones these guys were taking, that started initiating fat storage. 
albeit in this kind of visceral space, resulting in this oddly protruding belly, but under un, but underneath this, you know, massively hypertrophic six pack. And that once upon a time when Lou and Arnold were just taking um, anabolic steroids in the form of, you know, testosterone and the like, well, then they were getting the best mix. I would say these guys, every guy who's bodybuilding, I would never take insulin. Uh, me personally, Max, if I was going to, if I was going to be on a movie and I needed to take my shirt off, I would, um, I hate that this will sound incriminating. I would never take a single picamole of insulin in my body to do that, but I would absolutely get on anabolic steroids like testosterone analogs. And mind you, you have to be careful. There's a cocktail that goes into this and you got to make sure it's not getting converted to, to, to estrogens too much. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that would be the way to get jacked because then the testosterone is both building mass, lean mass while facilitating, um, what, while ensuring that there's not a kind of commensurate um, fat storage going on at the same time. So the introduction of insulin in the bodybuilders regimens could have been what has resulted in this very odd physique where they have these weirdly fat bellies underneath six packs. Fascinating. A lot of these guys with the great bodies in movies, they're really just lean. They're not all that big. They're just shredded. They're on these highly yeah. restrictive diets, right? Because their roles and their ultimately their, their bills getting paid relies on that. Um, but Max, so I'll be honest. I think a lot of them are on the juice. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. I'm um, like, you look at, you look at Dwayne Johnson, um, and compare his earlier physique from 10 or 15 years ago till now. And, and he's gotten 10 or 15 years older and just how much more jacked and ripped he is. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't even say this in a kind of, um, uh, denigrating or insulting way because I get it. I mean, if your job is to make hundreds of millions of dollars a year and you got to look jacked, absolutely get on the juice, just cycle on and off, make sure someone's giving you good advice. I don't mean to sound like I'm overly enthusiastic about mm -hmm. steroids. I'm clearly not a user myself. Um, but, but I, I, I think, uh, I think it's unfair of us to ourselves if we don't look at some of these guys and say, oh, yeah, he was on the juice when he got jacked for that movie. I, th I suspect that is far, far more common than anyone would want to admit. Yeah, and I don't can, blame them. You can kind of tell. I mean, some of these some of these actors, they, they have a muscle density that just appears abnormal. Right. But some of them, yep. I think some of them. Like my generation, we uh, we will usually cite the Brad Pitt fight club body as being mm, like mm. the idealized male form. Yeah, he bet, wasn't on the juice. No, I bet in a T-shirt, he was actually a really small guy at the time, just, just yeah. shredded and with yeah. great lighting. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. And you go in fasted. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly the kind of physique that I lean to. Um, just my personally kind of small build. Um, there's a blessing and a curse not to kind of go off on a weird tangent. The same bodies that can get very jacked or, or muscled are the same bodies that can get fat more easily typically. And then the bodies like me that have a harder time really laying on a layer of muscle and tend to be kind of just leaner are the same bodies that typically have a slightly harder time gaining fat. Not that I can't get fat. I can, but just like I don't really get too muscled. I don't really get too fat. I'd have to, you know, I tend to be just naturally leaner, both muscled and fat. Um, but again, there's a kind of a trade-off there where the biggest, strongest bodies also tend to be the bodies that can get the fattest. Mm. So just to close the loop on the uh, insulin and muscle story, it seems that insulin, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it's it's anabolic to to adipose, to adipocytes, sort of sort of fat cells, but it's it's more anti-catabolic is the way to think about it in Perfect. terms of muscle cell. Perfect. Yep. That's a good way of saying it. Love that. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, super, super fascinating um, stuff. So in terms of like what people, like how people should construct their their day-to-day -day diets, I mean, uh, I'm sure you're not a, a one-size-fits-all diet kind of person. Yeah. Everybody has to, you know, tailor their 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 food choices to their specific needs. You know, I mean, some people listening to this might be like mega athletes. Some people might be more, you know, uh, desk jockeys, right? But in general, um, yeah, like how many meals a day should we be eating? Uh, does that matter? Meal timing and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I agree completely. Of course, there is not one way to do this. Uh, and I want, want, before I answer this, I would want everyone listening to know 
that while I present these ideas in their simplest way, and the ideas themselves are simple, I very readily understand that the implementation of these ideas is far from easy. Because the moment people start changing habits, they tend to start dealing with addictions. And, and so I acknowledge that, that implementing these ideas are is, is much, much harder than the understanding the idea. Now, having said that, I think that there are some concepts um, that apply uh, across all people, um, which is we eat too much. We eat too frequently, I, I should say, and we eat the wrong things. So with regards to the wrong things or the right things, um, I do believe that those three dietary rules based on the three macronutrients apply to everyone. Control carbs, prioritize protein, don't fear fat. And with the control carbs, it's basically don't eat carbohydrates that come from bags and boxes with barcodes. I love Focus that, by the way. Yeah, focus on the least starchy, sugary fruits and vegetables. Eat them, don't drink them, and enjoy them liberally. And then eat as much protein and fat as you want, ideally from animal sources because it's just more nutrient-dense and better for the body. Um, so those rules apply to everyone, and people can implement them differently. So you could have a guy who's just saying, all right, I'm going to eat nothing but steak. Um, high five, good for you. Someone else says, well, I really like um, salads. I would only say to the salad eater – Try to find a meat other than chicken all the time. Mm. What about, you know, like if you can put some shredded um, beef on, not, uh, yeah, but just some sliced beef, um, you know, any other options because beef is just so much more nutritious than chicken is. Um, I, in fact, I think if there's any such thing as a superfood on the planet, I, I firmly believe it's any meat from a ruminant animal will have every nutrient the person needs and they're going to live a, a, a healthy life. Uh, but but anyway, that point aside, with those three rules in mind, people can incorporate them differently. They could still have a diet that has a lot of fruits and vegetables, and by volume may mostly be fruits and vegetables, but there's still a great degree of fat and protein to help ensure adequate nutrition and satiety. And so that's the way um, I think to incorporate those rules. And then with regards to meal frequency, you'd asked about meal timing. There is no question including a paper that was just published today, finding that when you eat in the evenings, especially later in the evening, even when calories are controlled, Max, another hit to this just calorie in, calorie out paradigm, it's just a matter of balancing calories. In these study subjects, isocaloric diets, the group that ate some of their calories in the late evening had lower metabolic rates and gained more weight than the other groups. Wow. And, and so theoretically, if it's just pure calories in, calories out, it shouldn't matter. But if we appreciate the circadian rhythm, which is to say a hormone rhythm, where hormones ebb and flow, that's what the circadian rhythm is really playing into, then we realize that when we eat foods at different times, there's uh, the insulin effect, for example, will be different. The cortisol or the glucagon effect will be different. All of these hormones that play into metabolism. So with regards to timing, it is much better to eat earlier in the day. However, it's easier to fast earlier in the day, like socially and just culturally. Um, for example, we know from multiple studies now that it is metabolically better to fast through dinner than it is to fast through breakfast. So it's better to fast in the evening and eat, you know, say breakfast and lunch, but it's also the worst time to fast. I'm a husband and a father and dinner time is sacrosanct. <laughs> Although it's not always perfect in my home and there's just as much fighting as there is loving, you know, <laughs> or more. But even still, I'm not going to sit around the kitchen with my family and not eat dinner with my family. Right. I'm not going to do that to hell with any kind of metabolic advantage. I just don't care. I'm a husband and father light years above being a metabolic scientist and anything else. Um, th that is so far down my priority list. Important, but vastly overshadowed. So. I choose to fast through breakfast, typically. And, and this is something I think people could take advantage of. A lot of people are not hungry in the morning. They eat out of this misplaced sense of, uh, you know, place, built on misplaced mantras that uh, breakfast is the most important meal. Well, why? Uh, where does that idea come from? Other than a marketing um, message from Kellogg's from 60 years ago. Um, if you're not hungry in the morning, don't eat. Um, but then. My advice is have a very big filling lunch. Let lunch be your biggest meal of the day. And then you taper off at dinner. And then you don't eat after that. No snacking in the evening. That has got to be, maybe that's 
maybe the most single important thing and yet the hardest, unfortunately, for most people um, to do because evening is kind of the witching hour of temptation. And I can say for myself, there could be a pint of Ben and Jerry's nearby, chilled and ready to go. And I could look at it all day with absolute disinterest. It won't appeal to me at all until like 8 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> and then once the kids are in bed or, you know, they're kind of winding down, the house is clean and it's time to just truly relax. Now, all of a sudden, that little pint of Ben and Jerry starts calling out my name or even worse for me, Max, if this is confession time for a moment, it's cereal. If we have something like shredded mini wheats in the house, and this is absolutely a consequence of my college days, when you're just a typical dude eating nothing but cereal um, all the time, um, the cereal, it takes a Herculean discipline for me. As much as I know, as much as my brain is telling me, Ben, you know everything that's going to happen if you eat that starchy, sugary thing with that whole milk, and it's going to light up every part of your brain. You know metabolically exactly what's going to happen to every carbon. I still will say, ah, I don't care. I'm just going to have a little. And I'll convince myself that I'm going to have one little small bowl, knowing that I'm so addicted to cold cereal that I will not stop at one bowl. I know there's a part of me that knows that I'm tricking myself. And humans are great self-deceivers in many, many ways. Even me, with as much as I know, if there is a box of cold cereal in the house, other than the most bland things like Rice Krispies or something, then I will not, it will take it will be very rare for me to not indulge and overindulge. And I go to bed hyperglycemic. I'm full. And so my heart is pounding um, and it's, it's going, it's racing. My body is uh, hotter. All of these are consequences of hyperglycemia. You activate this anxiety system, if you will. And I sleep terribly. I wake up and I'm ashamed of myself. I can't believe I've done it. And now I'm setting up this kind of shame cycle. And so for me and my family, um, we don't have cold cereal in the house other than Rice Krispies, which the kids eat very infrequently because we make homemade breakfast every morning for them. Um, but it's nice. But it's as much for my kids as it is for me because daddy can't handle it. And my kids, they think that it's because, oh, my parents don't want us to eat it because it's junk. It is junk. But it's because dad is so addicted that it's like crack cocaine and I'm an addict. So the, the idea of moderation in all things, which every dietitian loves to spout as if there's some genius, it flies in the face of addictions. It refuses to acknowledge that some people are addicted to some things. I tend to have an addictive personality. I've learned that about myself through my years of growing up and my years of marriage. My wife does not. Max, I look at her with such curiosity and wonder because she could, uh, let's go back to Ben and Jerry's. We could both have a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. She has this remarkable befuddling ability to open up that pint, eat five dainty cute little bites, put the lid back on and put it back in the freezer. And I'm looking at her as it's like spilling down my mouth because I'm not going to stop until I've gotten to the very bottom of that pint. And even then I'm looking at her pint and thinking I should probably eat hers too. Cause it's probably going to go to waste. If I don't, I can't, I mean, it's, it's like once that part of my brain lights up, it's, it's so difficult for me to turn off. And thus I kind of embrace the, the idea from St. Augustine, who said famously, and it's been kind of transliterated, abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. It is better for me to never open that pint of Ben and Jerry's. It's easier for me to look at it and just say no, mm. to quote Nancy Reagan, than it is for me to open it up and stop after a few bites. So the idea of moderation is wonderful in principle. But not in application, because too many people are addicted to things that are sweet and gooey or salty and crunchy. And once they start eating them, they cannot moderate. They will not stop until their stomachs are bursting or they've run out of it, whatever it may be. And so we need to be honest and true to this knowledge and accept I am not a moderator. So I'm not going to get that cereal at all. I'm stronger in the grocery store than I am in the evenings when I'm at home, or I'm not going to buy that ice cream because I'm stronger in the grocery store than I am at home. Because the moment I open it, I know I won't be able to, I, that's when we can be more honest with ourselves and not deceive ourselves like so many people do. But once again, it's just kind of this prevailing paradigm that we get so wrong. We tell people, people to eat a lot of carbs. We tell them to eat six times a day. We tell them, don't think of any food as bad. Um, and so it's moderation in all things. 
that doesn't work for addictive tendencies. And there are a lot of addictive, addictive tendencies these days. Especially with, you know, modern hypo satiating, hyper palatable foods. It's a, it's a big problem. Maybe the issue with your, with your ice cream addiction is that you bring it to the couch. Maybe if you yeah. could just, you know, it sounds like your wife is just taking it out of the, free, the, the freezer, taking a spoonful, putting it back in. You're, you are bringing it to the couch. And I think that's probably the problem. I, I absolutely do. Um, I absolutely do. Um, but even still, I don't think I could stop. Even if I'm sitting at the counter, um, it's, I just can't stop. <laughs> So yeah. it's better for me to never start or, or, or it's just, it's a rarity where we're going out to the ice cream shop and then my kids are getting some scoops of ice cream and I'm going to get just a single scoop and I'll eat it there and I'm done. Portion control. And it never comes home. Yeah. So I, I have to force those constraints on myself. Same, where if actually. there's ice cream in the house, I will indulge and no one's there. And so I feel like I can get away with it, even though I'm ashamed of it. But if I'm out and about then it's easier to portion control because it's more social. I know I don't have the time. There are a lot of people around. And so I can eat that one scoop and feel perfectly satisfied from it and then be done with it. Yeah, that's the problem that I have with this intuitive eating movement. I mean, for, for some of us, you try to listen to your body and intuitively eat. But what if your body intuitively wants to eat the whole pizza pie? Yep. Right. Instead of just the single slice or the whole Absolutely pint of agree. ice cream. Absolutely. It's one of those ideas that just sounds so beautiful. It's too good to be true. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. And you're more insulin sensitive in the morning. So you have uh, ability to deal with the food that you're consuming better and put it to better use. As the day goes on, you become more insulin resistant slowly. So the food that you do take in in the afternoon, and the evening, you are less likely to utilize as fuel and more likely to store.